Hey, it's very, very nice to see you. We have a microphone which amazingly, I think, is working. Yeah. A bit. Anyway, I've asked all the panelists, please project, talk loudly, talk clearly. Um, you're being recorded. You're being videoed. I want everybody, even in the far corners, to hear what we say, because particularly we've got a really interesting topic and a wonderful panel tonight. Welcome to the second in this second series of six seminars on the uses and abuses of history. History now and then, as we call them. Many of you will know that we ran a similar series last year, didn't exhaust the topic, so this is the second of, as I say, the second series in which we look at the ways that people use and abuse the past. We began a month ago, the first of this second series, with all the complex and controversial issues raised by the whole <coughs> issue of the, the, the Rhodes statue, you know, should memorials to figures of whom we now disapprove be removed, or is that false to history? Uh, what about people today apologizing for things in the past that they didn't actually themselves do? Is this right or wrong? Got into quite a lot of interesting discussions about that. And more generally, how far should history be rewritten in according with our changing attitudes and values? Today, we deal with the question of historical change. What brings it about? Why is so much history written about change? Wars, revolutions, changes of regime, dramatic changes in the past, rather than the great continuities. I'm, I'm overstating it slightly, but I remember when I worked in the BBC for many years, going through the archives to make history programs, The Long March of Every Man, and things of that kind. There was endless material once you got into the 20th century. Good archive stuff about the Great Strike, um, the Jarrow March, the abdication, World War II, and so on, uh, the latest serial murderer, um, <laughs> abnormal storms, and, and floods in the West Country. Almost nothing about what it was like going to work in the morning, getting on a bus, being a bus driver, being a teacher, going and seeing Granny at the weekend which are the things that most people were doing most of the time, but these didn't seem to count, certainly in terms of BBC archives, as the things that would go into programs about history. <laughs> the great political leaders were there, of course, um, everyone from Hitler, you know, ranting to adoring crowds, to the dogged and uplifting wartime inspiration of Winston Churchill which I remember as a child, I was born before the war, I remember listening and being very excited to hear some of the, the Churchill broadcasts and so on. Um, but how far is historical change brought about by great leaders, uh, the great men, the great heroes, <laughs> as Thomas Carlyle wrote about back in the 1840s? I don't know if you've ever read your way all the way through War and Peace, but in the long final epilogue, um, Tolstoy pours uh, withering scorn on this theory. Um, Napoleon, about whom we will doubtless hear shortly. Um, of course, uh, Tolstoy was not a great fan of Napoleon, describes him <laughs> like a child holding onto the straps inside a carriage, imagining he's driving it. <laughs> the metaphor. Uh, and then there are theorists like Karl Marx, to whom again, some people will hear about later on, who kind of history unfurls as a kind of dialectical process between the socio-economic or the material groupings with which we all inevitably tend to think and act. So, what is it that makes for historical change? How far is this brought about by <coughs> the decisions and actions of individuals? And how far from deeper underlying causes? To discuss these issues, we have an outstanding panel, I think I can say, this evening, a group of historians who, between them, cover an extraordinarily wide, varied range of interests. I'm going to ask each of them to talk for, broadly speaking, 10 minutes or so, but not a great deal longer. 
And then at about seven or thereabouts, when they've all spoken, we'll open the questions to the floor, have half an hour or so, and I'm hoping that round about half past seven we will all adjourn for a well-earned drink and we can chat to the panelists and tell them where you think they went wrong or what they're what writing <laughs> next. <laughs> and when the alcohol and the orange juice are exhausted, and so are we, um, Lawrence Goldman, director of the institute here, uh, and I will go off with the panelists to uh, go and uh, go off to a restaurant about 8.15, 8 something like that. So we've got a very good couple of hours ahead of us. Let me just say a few words about each of the panelists, and then I'll ask them uh, to speak uh, in order. Margaret McMillan, nearest to me. Margaret was uh, born and raised in Canada and is now Warden of St. Anthony's in Oxford. She's probably best known for her work on what led to the outbreak of World War I and also on the peace conference that followed it. Her book about Nixon's breakthrough in China, we'll be hearing more about China later on, I expect, and a study of uh, British women in the Raj. If you want to know about the uses and abuses of history, a phrase I've already used, this is precisely the subject of Margaret's brilliant short book, Dangerous Games, which I can strongly recommend to you. Um, her most recent publication is also relevant to tonight's seminar. It's a collection of essays which began life, I think, as a series of broadcasts entitled History's People, Personalities and the Past, in which, in addition to writing about famous personalities in the past, Hitler, Stalin, Bismarck, and so on, FDR, uh, Margaret, you also devote substantial sections to individuals that few would have heard of, women who kept a diary or penned a memoir in for example, pre-independent Canada or colonial India. So personalities and history. But let me move on from Margaret. I mentioned Margaret's book about Nixon uh, and Mao in, in, in China in 1972. Rana Mitter there at the end of the, 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 the table. Rana knows a thing or two about this. He's also based in Oxford, professor of the history and politics of modern China. Much of Rana's work has concentrated on China's various struggles to come to terms with the post-war world, the Cold War, years and beyond. But he's also gone back, very importantly, to the Second World War. We in this country tend to think of the war as beginning in September 1939. The Americans think it began in December 1941. Um, but for the Chinese, of course, it goes back to the Japanese invasion of 1937, if not, I guess, the invasion of Manchuria half a dozen years earlier. Um, and Rana is author of an outstanding study of the Sino-Japanese War, 1937 to 45. He's also, as many of you know, a frequent and very, very fine broadcaster, he used to be on uh, what was then night waves on a regular basis. Um, Andrew Roberts, sitting next to him, Andrew is uh, also um, a frequent and prolific broadcaster and an impressively prolific author. You may know his writings, for example, on the House of Windsor, some of the great political and military leaders of the past couple of centuries, from Napoleon, very important uh, recent book on Hitler, uh, through to Hitler, Churchill. He's at the moment, I don't think it's secret, working on a major new biography of Churchill. And he's written on the very nature of <coughs> art of war. You write down to of masters and commanders and of, of, and of titans. And you've lectured, including at my old university, Cornell, I noticed, on great European leaders of the 19th and 20th centuries and their influence on history. But Ad has also written about the experience of the ordinary Tommy, letters home from the front, what it was like on the first day of the song. Uh, and indeed also explored some of the ifs of history things that might have happened if this or that had been done differently, a topic that we'll be coming back to, incidentally, in more detail in our January session. Our fourth panelist, <coughs> Gareth Stedman jones Gareth has long been at the forefront of a very different school of history, although, although both he and Andrew have tended to concentrate on British and European history during the 19th century and well into the 20th. But where Andrew's focused on the movers and shakers, if you like, Gareth, uh, who's 
professor of the history of ideas at Queen Mary, and uh, also served incidentally on the editorial board of New Left Review, and was one of the founders with Ralph Samuel of the History Workshop Journal. Gareth was concentrated rather on the development of political thought from the French Revolution onwards, and he sought always, at least as much of his work as I've read, to place it within the deeper social and economic context of the times. This is true whether he's writing about poverty, he's written about class, religious attitudes, the intellectual origins of socialism, and it's true in his most recent book, an outstanding book published, I think, earlier this year, just very recently, a highly acclaimed intellectual biography of Karl Marx, which incidentally, I notice you, you subtitle Greatness and Illusion. So a lot to talk about here. And anyway, enough from me. What or who brings about historical change and how? I think we're in for a really interesting evening, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to call on Margaret Macmillan. Margaret, if you wouldn't mind, to begin. And remember, the microphone's not terribly good. Okay, thank you. I'll do my best. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, as always, to be here. I'm going to do a very Canadian thing and try and find the middle ground <laughs> and be peaceful about it. Um, seems a good idea at the moment, I think. Um, <laughs> Because I do think there are tensions, as there should be. I mean, what we do in history is, is talk about the past, but we also talk about how we should talk about the past. And there are many ways of talking about the past. I don't think any of them is necessarily any better than any other. I think we need many approaches to the past. I think that's what makes history an interesting and a, and a rich field. We ought to be able to disagree. We ought to be able to understand that it's perfectly all right to disagree when we try and understand something as complicated as the past and change in the past. I think there are schools in history which argue that individuals matter more than the great impersonal forces, and there are schools which would argue that the great impersonal forces matter more than the individuals. I think it both have their place. I think both have something to offer. I think there's often a caricatured view of the great man theory of history, which is attributed to Thomas Carlyle. I went back couple of summers ago and read quite a bit of Carlyle, and you know, he's not entirely as he's made out to be. He said in an early essay on history, history is made up of innumerable biographies. I think he understood that people in particular societies behave, think, feel, react in particular ways. I think we all understand that. We all understand that there are values, there are ways of doing things in the past which shape the ways in which individuals in those pasts behave. We can't subtract the individual from his particular circumstances because we are all produced by the societies <coughs> in which we grew up and we absorb <coughs> or react against the prevailing ideas in those societies. But I think what we, at least what I try to do, is find that balance between understanding the forces that do indeed move history along, technological change, changes in the means of production, changes in ideas, changes in power, changes in demography, changes in science, all these things contribute to change in history. But I think we also have to take into account the role of individuals at particular times. Sometimes it really does matter who is in power. And it matters whether that person is a strong person or a weak person. It's not just the forceful individual moving history along, it's sometimes the individual who doesn't have the backbone to stand up to some of the pressures. I'm thinking in the latter case of the outbreak of the First World War, the three key leaders, in my view, were the, arch, were, were the, were the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, the Tsar of Russia, and the Kaiser of Germany. They all gave way to pressure from their military and signed the mobilization orders. If they had refused those three men, it would have been very difficult to mobilize the forces of their countries. And I compare what they did in that moment of crisis to what Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, did in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when he was also under tremendous pressure from his military, many of them older than him, many of them with rows of medals, rows of stars. He'd been a mere lieutenant in the Second World War. Although he had military experience, he was nothing like the generals and admirals and Air Force generals that he was up against 
And they told him, many of them, that he should confront the Soviets, that he should be prepared to invade Cuba, he should be prepared to take them on, even at the risk of nuclear war, and he resisted. And so I think it does actually matter, not all the time. I mean, I think we hope for times when it doesn't matter who's in office, when you can have someone who doesn't do very much in office. But sometimes it matters whether people are strong or whether they're weak. And I think we should also do a counterfactual and say, what would the history of the 20th century be like, for example, if Hitler had been killed in the First World War, as he very nearly was? It is quite possible, although I don't think foreordained, that Germany would have had a right-wing government particularly after the Great Depression, which hit Germany very hard. Quite likely that government may have pulled on populist feelings, played on the disappointment that many Germans, probably majority of Germans, felt with the way this First World War ended, the resentment that so many Germans felt about the Treaty of Versailles. But would any other leader, and I know it's a question impossible to answer, have gone as far as Hitler? Would any have persisted right to the end? Would any have been prepared to destroy the German nation in the way that he was prepared to destroy, destroy it. And I always think of that chilling thing that Hitler said when Albert Speer came to see him at the very end, when Hitler was in the bunker, I think it was the last meeting they had, and he ordered Speer, and it was clear that it was all over, the, the Soviet troops were already in the outskirts of Berlin, the Western Allies were advancing from the West, and Speer said to Hitler, uh, Hitler ordered Speer, he said, you must destroy all the remaining hydroelectric works, blow everything up. And Speer said, but how will the German people survive? And Hitler said, they don't deserve to survive. And I think we have to ask ourselves, would any other, even if the Nazi leaders have gone quite that far, would they have persisted to absolute destruction? I think we have to ask, what would have happened if Churchill had been killed when he was knocked down on Fifth Avenue in New York? I think it was at Andrew Roberts will correct me, I think at the beginning of the 1930s. But if Hitler has been killed... 1931. <laughs> I don't count that as a correction, I count that as a correction. <laughs> but if Churchill would be knocked down and killed, would Britain have behaved differently in 1940 when France fell? I think it's at least a valid question. I think at certain times, you really do have to look at the individual who has to make the decision, and who can either make a bad decision or make a good decision. Stalin, too. If Stalin had died when he had his appendix operation at the beginning of the 1920s, and it was quite probable that he could have died. He was in the middle of a civil war, medical attention was not all that good, he could have easily died, dangerous operation. Would any other of the Bolshevik leaders have persisted with collectivization in the way that Stalin did? We know that a number of them resisted. Bukharin, for example. We know that a number of them thought it was a very bad idea. You could see a really different route for Russia. You could see the sort of route that China eventually took under Deng Xiaoping if it hadn't been for Stalin. What I find so interesting is that historians who started out <coughs> as social historians, Ian Kershaw, for example, who I think is a marvelous historian, started out as a social historian of Nazi Germany, ended up by writing a biography of Hitler. Because I think he felt you couldn't understand the phenomenon of the Nazi regime in Germany without looking at Hitler himself. And that wasn't to say Hitler made it or created it, but that he represented a particular aspect of it. He did something with it. Um, Stephen Kotkin, who started out as a social historian of Soviet Russia, has ended up, he's partway through what I think is a very, very good biography of Stalin. Because again, he says you can't subtract Stalin from what actually happened, what made that regime. These were highly personal regimes. And so I would argue that Historians need to listen to each other about this. I don't think anyone or very few people would go down the road saying that <coughs> the individual makes history. The individual is made by his or her circumstances. If Napoleon had been born at any other time, he might not have had the opportunities that made him the leader of Europe. If he'd been born in the Ancien Regime, I doubt if he would have ever got very far because he didn't have the connections, didn't have the money. But he was born at a moment when he was able to rise. And there are probably many Napoleons, or would-be Napoleons, or potential Napoleons in the world, you will never hear of them. If Hitler had been born in Albania, he might have become head of that portable country, but he wouldn't have caused as much damage. So it's the circumstances, it's the time, it's the societies, it's the forces that produce the individual, but I would argue that sometimes the individual really makes a difference.
And if you think I'm wrong, think about the possibility of Donald Trump being president. <laughs> Talk and I'm, t but I'm terribly sorry you ended it the way you did. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go in alphabetical order and let me call upon Mitter, which comes after Macmillan, to be asked her rather to speak. I was thinking, rather, it's 40 years since the death of Mao, 50 years since the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. I imagine the Chinese must be having some difficulty in deciding to what extent Mao made <coughs> things happen. But anyway, over to you. Come and... Uh... Indeed. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Yes, Mao will certainly be, I think, good. <laughs> on our minds. I hope, is, that, is that clear for everyone? Yes. Good. If you can't hear me, raise your hands. <laughs> no, we'll clear in that case. Um, what I want to do is to pick up on the theme which Margaret has laid before us so ably. I have to say, Margaret is always a very hard act to follow, so I think it's very unfair that I should have to uh, <laughs> comment, but I will do my, uh, do my best. And I'm going to do that by speaking briefly, if I may, on the <coughs> subject that uh, Daniel very kindly uh, mentioned uh, in his introduction of the last book that I wrote on uh, China during the Second World War. And the reason I want to bring that up is not just to plug the book, although it's available to pay back <laughs> <laughs> for grandmother's Christmas presents, and blessings, yeah. but also because the structure, in a sense, I think really speaks to the problem, the question of balance between personalities and forces that Margaret brought up. And for all I know, I've got it entirely wrong, but I'll tell you what I did, and maybe that will provide some food for discussion as we go on a little later on. Within the book, the story of a very well-known event, the Second World War, but uh, I think a relatively very unknown aspect of it, at least in the Western world, the Chinese theatre, led to a sort of dilemma. How could I take the evidence and present it in a way that I thought would appeal to the audience that I was writing for, which was, in this case, not the Chinese, but of course, Western readers, both academics and people perhaps from a wider reading public. And the way I decided to do it um, was to take three personalities. And I'll just name them briefly, if I may. I also have to do a quick check to see if these are familiar names. Number one is indeed the man who would become the leader of all China, uh, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao. Everyone here, can we have hands up who's heard of him? <laughs> okay, for the camera I can say, see of hands up. <laughs> Second was the actual leader of China during the Second World War, a name who I think is remembered, but the details perhaps a bit fuzzy. Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader of China. So hands going up there. Okay, good, yep, good, good sea of hands. The third name was, is, Wang Jingwei. How many hands for him? Whoa, got yeah, I think three, something like that, in this, this quite packed audience here tonight. Well, that in a sense tells you something about the paths of history, because of course Mao Zedong was the one who ultimately came out on the winning side and became the ruler of China for more than a quarter of a century on the basis of his communist revolution. But in my view, one of the important elements of the Second World War was that it led to a contest between these three people, and that what was interesting was not just <coughs> their own lives, not just that they left behind considerable bodies of materials which were waiting there to be read and uh, uh, digested, but also that they were not just random figures chosen because of their attractive or unattractive personalities. But because in my view, they actually symbolize, in either case, one particular path, one particular view about China's future that was in its own way very distinctive. So briefly to explain what I mean, Mao Zedong, I mean in a sense, as by far the best known of those characters, the story is, is fairly evident, I think. He was a believer from an early age in radical revolutionary change in a China which had forced its last emperor to abdicate in the year 1911 and was then desperately searching for an alternative role in the world and in terms of the social turmoil within China itself. And as we know, the path of radical communist revolution was one that ultimately he was able to bring to fruition for good or for ill. Chiang Kai-shek, though, should be remembered because at the time, and certainly between the 1920s and the 1940s, 
he presided as China's leader over another type of nationalism, not the nationalism of a radical Marxist revolution, but rather a nationalism that was nonetheless radical in its own rather distinctive way, anti-liberal, but also strongly anti-imperialist. I have to say one of the intriguing parts of reading extensive extracts from Chiang Kai-shek's diaries, which are now available at the Hoover Institute, was, I'm afraid to say, Andrew, his rather fruity views on Winston Churchill, who did not get on with well at all, even though uh, he tended to have a certain number of splenetic uh, outbursts against Franklin D. Roosevelt, but Churchill really was at the, um, at the heart, although he did say he, Chiang Kai-shek, admired the cunning of the Anglo-Saxon race, which uh, Churchill might have taken as a sort of compliment at the, uh, at the time. So, a different sort of nationalist view that China would have a non-liberal government, that it would be very much an authoritarian state with a vanguardist nationalist party, but would also engage with the Western world, particularly under American tutelage rather than the British Empire. And then the third character, Wang Jingwei, the one who doesn't ring many bells in this room, or frankly anywhere else very much, is sometimes been called the Laval, or the Pétain of China. In other words, the one who collaborated with the Japanese invaders during World War II, who made a fateful decision in 1938 to fly to Hanoi, French Indochina, and there hook up with the Japanese. Because at that time he was convinced, the time when China was already had been invaded, a year earlier by the, by the Japanese, <coughs> um, at a time when it seemed that it would gain almost no international assistance, apart from a very limited amount of Soviet assistance in the first years of the, uh, first months, I should say, of the, uh, of the war against Japan. There was a great deal of international sympathy, but no troops and very little international financial assistance. And in those circumstances, Wang Jingwei, who was a prominent nationalist leader, certainly of the level of fame of someone like Pétain or Laval in the French context, made the decision that perhaps to prevent more bombings, to prevent more occupation, invasion, atrocities like the famous rape of Nanking, he would make the decision to collaborate with the Japanese. And while this decision in retrospect has been seen for understandable reasons as a gross betrayal of China, I thought that it was worth examining it in its own right from contemporaneous materials to understand why he would have decided that that path, a Chinese state that would exist under the, uh, um, the shadow of Japanese imperialism and pan-Asianism, was something that he felt was a necessary um, price to pay. And again, making the comparison with France there, I see in some senses three comparisons with, in some ways, similar French figures, in some ways not similar, of course, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's perhaps a little like de Gaulle, the man who insisted on what seemed like hopeless resistance at a time when all the rational calculations would have been towards surrender. A character perhaps like Maurice Torres, who uh, uh, led the, the French uh, Communist Party and was very much part of the resistance, but from a different sort of angle from de Gaulle, um, uh, and clearly one much more inflected by his own vision of Marxist change. And then, of course, the Pétain, or perhaps the Laval, the collaborators, who, in their own minds, found collaboration with the new German Empire in Europe a plausible path for creating a new État français, which was going to create a very different model, which threw off what they saw as the failure of the French Third um, Republic. Let me just give a few... Um, how many on time, actually, David? Sorry. Okay. Um, a few thoughts about... Why I found this an attractive way of putting forward the, uh, uh, the wider argument about China's dilemmas during World War II, but also why I think one has to admit that there are also limitations that one has to take into account. So at one level, looking at personalities enabled, us, enabled me to symbolize these three different parts, but also to understand how the connections between these people helped to forge the relationships that would eventually shape the war. So 20 years previously, back in the 1910s, 1920s, several of the people involved uh, uh, with the collaborationist movement had actually been founder members of the Chinese Communist Party. So they actually switched from left to right, you might say, during the course of that time. And yet they still kept up the personal relationships. So negotiations between the nationalists, the communists, and even the collaborators often happened amongst people who had sat together in small uh, tea houses in Beijing discussing political theory. 
um, or else a little later on, had all been part of the Wampoa Huangpu Military Academy, where they had had Soviet assistance in terms of, um, uh, of, of training, but also training in um, Marxist, uh, Marxist thought. And then again, in various institutions that emerged in the wartime period, including proto-parliaments, many of these people would sit together physically discussing the future of China and how it was going to come together. And I think these sorts of connections do matter in terms of understanding that for a very large country, often very small elite networks can be very, very influential. But with that, you have, I think, a set of issues that have to be acknowledged. One is that one of the greatest stories of the 20th century in China is the tremendous revolutionary social change which eventually did reshape it. And I think that social history can't be so easily captured in the personalities that I'm talking about, or even if the ideas can be, the effects of them aren't. So what I had to do was intersperse chapters which dealt with issues like refugee flight. Again, it's not often known that something like 80 to 100 million Chinese became refugees <coughs> in their own country during the course of the eight years of the war. And those stories are harder to recover. They often come from oral histories, from records made by literate people, such as missionaries or <coughs> uh, uh, government officials, um, from which you then have to reconstruct the kind of story which is much easier to read in the diary of a top leader who, of course, sits down and writes it, uh, writes it every day. But without those stories about refugees, social relief networks, communist mobilization in the countryside, you do not have a complete picture or a wider picture of why the war changed China in such a fundamental way. It's also the uh, continuing uh, problem of that kind of um, elite-driven personality that most of those leaders do tend to be men, even in the 20th century. I think we're fortunate in that this episode of Chinese history has one very prominent fi uh, female figure in the shape of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Song Mei-ling, who, of course, as a fluent English speaker, was the interpreter between Chiang Kai-shek and the Western world, in particular Roosevelt and Churchill at the Cairo Conference of November, December 1943. Mm -hmm. But the wider questions of how gender and other social relationships, class relationships also changed in China as a result of wartime devastation, occupation, and refugee flight is an equally important part of the story and one that involves personalities, but personalities of the unknown rather than of the widely known type. Um, and that, again, I think is an important element in trying to provide a more comprehensive uh, picture. The final reason, if I may, that I think that this is a set of subjects and debates that's well worth having, is that, of course, it is, I hope, of interest to historians. And again, in my own case, I was particularly keen to insert a new element into a comparative conversation about the political and social history of World War II where the Chinese story remains relatively unknown. But one of the things that was most interesting to me was that the book was translated into Chinese, two separate editions, one in Taiwan, complete, one in the mainland, with certain parts about Mao and his torture techniques in, uh, 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 in, uh, in rural China being cut out mysteriously at that time. But most of it actually got to, to stay in the mainland version. And I you know, went to both places and asked in the mainland in particular, why would you want a book about World War II in China by a Westerner to be translated back into Chinese and to be the subject of discussion? And the answer was that, in part, they were pleased, I think, that at least the Chinese side of the story was at least getting some attention in the West, but also it helped to inform a conversation which has been going on in China for quite some time. The fact that actually many of these figures and their doings are not just history, but current affairs, and I think for many people here, Margaret is certainly very well equipped to point out that history is not necessarily in the past. It informs the present in all sorts of ways. And one of the weirdest things when you go to China is to see the revival of Chiang Kai-shek's wartime history of resistance against Japan, having been for 40 years under Mao the figure of bourgeois, feudal, backward um, 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 uh, malice and, and, and evil. He's now regarded as an anti-Japanese patriot. If you went to his birthplace, which I have done in Shiko in Zhejiang province, you'd think that the man had won the Civil War in 1949. <laughs> 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 not a sight of Mao to be seen. It is more interesting, in a sense, to also remember that in 2021, 
we will see the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. And where Mao, who's a figure who still sits, portrait in Tiananmen Square, picture on all banknotes, and yet in some ways in a sort of historical limbo, someone whose terrible mistakes, including the Cultural Revolution, which had its 50th anniversary, of course, this year, hasn't yet been absorbed into Chinese history. In a strange way, bringing Chiang Kai-shek back into the story, a man who's dead and gone and can be confined to a sort of rather um, um, uh, sterilized version of the past, stands in real contrast to Mao Zedong, <coughs> who is still in some senses very much a figure who informs and gives legitimacy to the party of <coughs> Xi Jinping today. So those sets of thoughts about why I think we do need and can benefit from personality is, I think, a very important part of, uh, 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 of this wider discussion. But at the same time, the wider forces mustn't be uh, forgotten in that sense. Let me finally conclude with one last quote, which I think, in a sense, sums up what can be valuable, but also points out the, the personality-driven nature of much of what we talk about. One of my favorite scenes to write about in the book about China uh, in World War II was a man named Zhou Hai, who was Wang Jingwei's second in command. He was a collaborator with the Japanese, and he got on a plane to take the flight off to start his journey to perfection. And in his diary, he wrote, as my plane took off from the city of Chongqing, the wartime capital, I felt very melancholy. I found myself thinking of my dead lover, my former lover who died, Man Qiu, and found myself weeping for her. And I thought that moment tells you something very interesting about how even at a time of huge political change, a huge political turning point, <coughs> real people often turn very much to the personal and the emotional. And I think the combination of those two things are a very important thing to remember. Thank you. Thinking of faces that are on banknotes naturally <laughs> makes me think of the new plastic five pound note, which makes me think of Winston Churchill, which makes me think of Andrew Roberts. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and um, and many congratulations on so many of us coming here to uh, to talk about something so uh, esoteric as great men in, in history. Uh, I was going to actually congratulate you, but then I realized, in fact, you didn't come here of your own free will. You were only here because you've been impelled by vast impersonal forces <laughs> to, uh, to, to turn up here today. Um, thank you also, Dan, for, um, for reminding everybody of that 90 pages at the end of Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace, in which he makes these truly extraordinary uh, statements about how uh, France would have invaded Russia in 1812 had Napoleon um, not existed. This, ladies and gentlemen, is complete balderdash. It absolutely, desperately needed uh, one person for that to happen, and that person had to be Napoleon. There was no great movement in France to go to war again in 1812. They wanted peace. Uh, as far as they could get it in 1812, there was a, um, a unanimity amongst Napoleon's generals and his advisors, his marshals, um, that they shouldn't go to war with uh, an uninvadable, effectively uninvadable country like Russia. He didn't want to go as far as uh, Moscow. He got drawn in as far as Moscow as it turned out. But unless it had been for Napoleon, that invasion would not have taken place. And so it completely undermines the, um, the concept that Tolstoy uh, puts forward, the, the door of the, of the child hanging on to the straps of the, uh, of the carriage. Um, there are, of course, so many things in history that um, do not require individuals, or at least only require individuals in the mass, in the, in the millions. Um, you were always going to get the decline of, uh, of magic and the rise of science, for example. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't done by um, Isaac Newton. Uh, it would have happened without Isaac Newton. Um, you were always going to get uh, industrialization. You were going to get the collapse of feudalism and the, uh, and the rise of the nation state. All these, these huge um, tides of history were going to happen. But, but, 
you also need individuals in order to direct those tides, to see the way that they're going to go and to, uh, and to in some cases, master them, in other cases, direct them um, down one or any number of other uh, channels. History shouldn't be seen as in any way being predetermined along tram lines. All sorts of things can happen to nations. Look at, uh, um, look at the Soviet Union, which for 75 years went down into a, uh, into a railway siding, effectively, under communism. <coughs> uh, in the, in the, uh, the last three quarters of the 20th century. Um, when Hitler and uh, Churchill are considered, I'm not sure that those two necessarily also um, support my thesis in the same way that uh, Napoleon did. There would have been other men who uh, stood up against, um, against appeasement in the late 1930s. Um, George Lloyd was looking at it, Leo Amory was looking at it, where, um, Anthony Eden very lately, of course, uh, towards the end also, um, resigned over um, Mussolini. Um, there, is, uh, there was a don at Cambridge called Maurice Cowling, who put forward the Cowlingite view that basically, certainly in British politics, uh, if, there, if a lot of people believe in, in, in something and want something in British politics, there will always be at least one major politician who will uh, forget about his principles and move over to uh, personify that particular um, area of, uh, of belief. When one thinks of Boris Johnson in the <laughs> campaign, um, one, uh, one might be sort of drawn ineluctably, much as I love Boris, to uh, understand how the Cowlingite theory of uh, British politics works. Um, so if, he, if Churchill had been run over by the taxi on the 13th of December 1931, he would, um, none, nonetheless, uh, there would have been somebody to stand up. But would there have been somebody then um, to have done the other great things that happened in 1940, the decision to fight on, of course, um, against the Germans after Dunkirk, the uh, extraordinary speeches, that it really did take a lifetime of Churchill making uh, these, um, what were for many years just grandiloquent, sort of ham-acting, um, uh, musical kind of terms. But then when the Times connected with the, uh, with the oratory, you get some of the most sublime rhetoric in the English language. With regard to, uh, to Hitler, um, Margaret asked the question about whether or not he ultimately, uh, any, anybody else would have called for the destruction of the hydroelectric um, and, uh, and to have brought down the Gotterdammerung onto the, um, onto the German people because they had failed him in the, uh, in the final struggle. I, I uh, there, also slightly take issue because I think, yes, there were endless um, uh, ultra-fanatical Nazis. Goebbels, of course, poisoned his own six children down in the, um, down in the bunker uh, a couple of days before, um, before the collapse of the Reich. So um, Himmler committed suicide. One could see him also uh, going to that kind of, uh, of level. And various others, various uh, generals, Rendelink, uh, Scherner, um, Mona, etc who might well have done that kind of thing. Um, but it did take uh, Hitler to unleash the attack, the Barbarossa attack of the 22nd of June 1941, which again, none of his um, generals wanted, which uh, Haldo and the general staff did not uh, think was, uh, was either opportune or necessary. So there were decisions that it took Hitler to, uh, to make. Um, just as there were with, um, with Churchill. And we see this kind of contingency, don't we, ladies and gentlemen, over, over our own lives um, ourselves. Uh, if you haven't gone to that party, you might not be with the um, person you're, you're with in life. If you hadn't uh, decided to make that decision to, to buy that newspaper, you might not be doing the job you're doing. Um, uh, my friend Anne Applebaum was booked onto the Lockerbie flight, and she changed her her um, arrangements right at the last minute because she uh, had an invitation to go on the, uh, on the, on the television. If that had happened, uh, she would be dead today. So if you believe, as I do, that history is the amalgamation of billions of decisions made by billions of people for a myriad of different uh, reasons, um, then contingency clearly plays a huge part in that, and we're not um, the subject just of what T.S. Eliot called these, these vast impersonal forces. Um, 
There is also a, uh, a sense, I think, that, um, um, that history has no natural um, grand design. There's nothing, there's nothing that has to happen in, in history. And um, to sum up, really, um, although um, in Einstein's uh, favorite uh, dictum, um, God uh, doesn't play at dice, at least he allows us to. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
to agriculture, and so the Malthusian problem will go away because um, science will overcome it. Now, the interesting thing about that is that Owen sets up what he calls halls of science, which are going to be the alternative to the churches. Um, and a young enthusiast who goes to one of those churches in 1842 is Frederick Engels. When he goes to Manchester, he attends these halls of science, and he takes over the criticisms which the Owenites have used against, against what they call commercial society, um, by cheap sell their sort of ideas. Um, and he writes on that basis a critique of political economy, uh, a, a, a one which is thoroughly based on Owenism, which comes to the attention of Marx, and that in turn puts Marx in the line to make in, into what is going to be his, his life work, which was critique of political economy. He gets all that originally from Engels. Um, and one of the, uh, in, in the book that I write about Marx, one of the things that I do think was uh, a claim to greatness um, was what he says in the Communist Manifesto at the beginning, that the bourgeoisie, and don't forget this is a paean of praise to the bourgeoisie, the Communist Manifesto, have achieved in a hundred years more than a thousand generations before had ever achieved. <coughs> and uh, so he, <coughs> I think, in a way which still is, 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 is um, <coughs> still means something now, um, conveys the power and restlessness of capitalism and so on. Um, his politics is another thing. I mean, it didn't sort of, it was fairly juvenile in 1848. It was completely willful. Um, but he did sort of grow up. And in the 1860s, he becomes more um, uh, aware of possibilities of something which is not going to be a proto um, Bolshevik revolution or anything like that, but what he calls pressure from without. And he sees the future uh, as a transition uh, towards social democracy through the First International, at the same time the Second Reform Act is going on, so it all looks pretty hopeful, just for a few years. Um, and that's one of, the, and, uh, one of the things that he does do is articulate the language of social democracy, which has lasted all the way down, well, to recent years. Whether it will ever survive now is a different question, but that is, uh, I think, one of his achievements. Um, but uh, this idea of progress then has two sides. One is the idea of scientific progress, and the other, which of course Marx has introduced, um, is, is the role of the working class. And one of the things I think which we particularly have to look at today is uh, that actually there was always an undercurrent of um, dissatisfaction which led to a certain form of protectionism among, uh, among the workers. Um, Marx was very surprised in the 1850s when he was writing for the New York Daily Tribune to get a congratulation from an economist called Henry Perry, who sent his book to him and said, we're obviously saying the same thing, more or less. Uh, Perry was a protectionist. He was a follower of Hamilton. He was one of the people who inspired Lincoln and very much had a following among American working men. And it was all about how British free trade was swamping the world, swamping the Ameri Americas, doing down the American working man and so on. Um, and, and another episode also is worth recording, and that is a famous book which becomes the foundation stone of Marxism uh, called The anti dury by Engels. That was written in the early 1870s, and the interesting thing is, why did he write it? Because during, um, had gathered a following in the University of Berlin of, of intellectuals and workers and so on. And again, what he was doing was retailing the theories of Henry Carey and protectionism. So there's always this undercurrent, and of course in Britain you've got Chamberlain and, and the whole the issue about um, free trade in the Edwardian period. Uh, so what we're facing today, I'm not saying it's, it's um, too similar, but there, there's, there's always this relationship between progress and workers. You know, this particular way of thinking about things has been slightly provisional. 
um, and people have forgotten that sometimes. Um, well, what I want to uh, say is that when you get to the 1950s and 60s, this whole theory of progress is really comes under fire. Obviously, politically it does so because of the crisis of communist parties and so on. But it also comes under theoretical criticism. And, that's be and this is where it links up with what we're saying about history, if you like. Um, because it's seen then as teleological. Um, and the thing that either Anglo-Saxon criticism or French criticism, the one thing they can all agree on, this theory no longer works because it's teleological. Um, but that leads, and, and this is really the point I want to um, draw to a conclusion on, is um, not just a reaction against teleology, the idea that history has a certain end and that you know everything would, would fit into it, which was obviously being disrupted by what, what had happened in the 20th century. Um, but also, in the French case, it leads to the idea that history itself had been a false god. Um, and what you get then is a series of theories which try to, uh, try to suggest you can do without history. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Foucault, um, and, and, and uh, also something which is, I only heard about the other day, called the spatial turn. Instead of having time as your, um, your, your um, compass, so to speak, you have space. And they have a journal called Herodotus. And they claim that Herodotus was a, ge a geographer and not a historian. <laughs> so they have fairly basic sort of claims. Um, but I think the point about all this is uh, that <coughs> what, what, what has happened in, in this theory is that they've preserved some of the most, uh, some of the least likable aspects, if you like, of, of Marxism, which is the determinism, the um, and the complete um, uh, what would we say? demotion of any idea of greatness of individuals um, in 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 um, sorry I'm just in Foucault you have uh, people occupy subject places um, they're not actually so that you don't have um, even the biographies of individuals at all. They're simply roles which are played by people. Um, and you don't, have, um, you don't have the tyranny of teleology. You have a completely, as it were, random set of, of, of layers, which he calls archaeology. Um, anyway, what I wanted to end up by saying is that language is important, and insofar as these alternative models were built upon language rather than uh, history, I think it's possible to preserve uh, an idea about the individual, about, um, uh, about personalities, um, and to get rid of some of the uh, aspects like the demotion of the individual um, and, and uh, of, yeah, well they have something called the death of the author, the death of the, um, of the great man and so on the dismantling of the subject um, and the idea that relations of power is everything that there is. Um, and I think coming back from all that, I mean, one goes back to a simple idea of history um, in which uh, there is uh, human agency matters a great deal. And just one last thought on this is that the Marx that I talk about in the book has more relation uh, to Hegel than it does to Engels. Um, and by that I mean that there was a tradition in the 18th and century and going through into Engels and then Marxism, which is that, and it starts from Owen and various other Helvetius and so on, uh, the human being is a creature of nature. He, he pursues pleasure and he avoids pain. Um, we have to create an environment for that individual which is, is benign, which will then produce a benign character in, in reverse. Um, but the idea is that there is that the, the human race in some sense are the passive products of nature. Well, from Kant 
or even perhaps Leibniz its onwards, you have a, an alternative theory, which is that mankind, or the individual human being, has the ability to withstand these impulses, to act according to reason, rather than according to simple desire of the senses and so on. And that's, as a way, that's why I, in, I also brought in Hegel, because Hegel says that's not just an individual trait, that's a, a trait which can be institutionalized in particular societies. Um, and uh, when you get to, when you get to the so-called beginning of, of Marx and Engels' partnership, um, Marx says in his writings, man is not just a natural being, he is a natural human being. He is not, as it were, the product of nature, or he is part of that, but he also is the product of history, and the history which he makes for himself. And in that sense, of course, we, I can always I can come back to what uh, the other three speakers already said, which is actually uh, persons of one kind or another can embody a particular moment. They can do so with particular ability, particular intuition, or whatever. And in that sense, of course, um, great men or great women can affect the course of history, not by being arbitrary of themselves, but somehow capturing some moment. Um, like, however, Oh, I'm sorry to end on Trump, as we all <laughs> know, um, but however horrible Trump may be, he is, I think, talking to some real anger among, uh, uh, particularly at the sort of white male working class population in America and beyond. Um, and in that sense, he, that's the moment, that's why he's so powerful, um, but it's a power which comes from embodying something larger than the individual. So I'll end on that note. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, I'm reminded, I, I think it was probably Oscar Wilde who said, anybody, any individual can make history, but it takes a genius to write it. <laughs>